Thank you very much for the introduction. That was a very good day. Um, we, uh, we played in the final of the World Cup in uh, the Netherlands, against the Netherlands, and uh, the final score was 6-1. Um, it's not a result that's ever likely to recur again, I think, so it was a very, very good day for us. I'm going to uh, speak to you today about... Uh, and I, I'd prefer to move around. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm going to speak to you today about my experience as uh, coaching national team for 14 years. But, uh, and unashamedly, I'm going to speak about uh, the elite end of sport. But I think what you have to understand is that I started coaching when I was 17 years old. Um, probably uh, uh, some of you are of, uh, only a, a few years older than that. And so I've had uh, a lot of experience. And, and what I'm hoping to share with you is a bunch of lessons that, uh, that I've learned over a lifetime of coaching. And as I said, uh, I'll be talking about what happens at the elite end, but in the end, the things that are in coaching uh, at the elite end are the same things that exist at every level. And uh, there are a range of messages that I think would be uh, useful to you. A copy of, uh, of what I'm saying will be available to you, uh, um, I'm, I'm sure, through the, uh, through the people running the conference. So. Uh, you don't necessarily have to, uh, if, if I put a slide up that's busy or got a message in it, you don't necessarily have to uh, um, take a photo of it. I'm sure you'll be able to get a copy of it later. These lessons that I uh, have learned as a coach, as I said, are equally important for people coaching at any level. I fundamentally believe that as a coach you have two responsibilities. You have to make... Uh, the experience of uh, being involved in activity fun and you have to make it interesting. And uh, whatever level, whether you're coaching the national team or five-year-old kids or school boys and girls uh, or uh, your state team, you better, you better create an environment in which people are enjoying themselves but also are challenged. Uh, that's an environment in which they're more likely to learn and you're all more likely to make progress. And I'm going to share with you 15 lessons today, um, and I'll talk uh, a little bit about those as I go through. Here they are. And as I said, uh, you, you don't, I'm sure you don't need to write them down, but uh, I'll go through them uh, one by one. These are things that I think uh, over a lifetime I believe in and are important for you uh, to, uh, to follow. If you do nothing else when you're coaching, you have to bring energy and commitment to what you do. You have to uh, provide uh, life to the program. You have to make, uh, make it uh, something that people want to be involved in, and it's your energy and commitment that's important. You better know what you want and you better stand for it. You better understand what you believe needs to be done. But I put the word there until Know what you want and stand for it until. What's until about? <clears throat> Anybody got a suggestion? The until is because things change. Um, what was uh, appropriate to be doing 10 years ago maybe has changed. Maybe there's something new and different. You have to be continuously learning. Coaching's a dynamic thing. And uh, it's important that uh, um, when the time comes, you're able to shift and flexible enough to do so. Because part of the deal is you've got to be keeping in touch with things. And the final point that I've got on this slide, and for me, uh, it's a central point in whatever you do. You always have to insist on quality and excellence. And the theme for coaching is coaching better every day. Um, Aristotle, of course, was a Greek philosopher, and Aristotle said, you are what you continually do. You are what you continually do. Excellence is not an act, it's a habit. And with our athletes, even the, the very young ones, we are trying to uh, develop in them habits which are reproducible and uh, will serve them throughout their lives. 
whatever they're doing and the lessons that come from being involved in a sporting program are important. But number one for me in terms of coaching is you insist on quality, you set high standards and uh, it's important that uh, that's central to what you do. This is a really busy slide and it uh, talks about my coaching experience. If you can see, I took over the women's hockey team after the Barcelona Olympics and took them through to Sydney. And the interesting thing about the slide is it talks about how the program changed over that period of time. From being quite hierarchical when I first started, I was a young coach and I thought I knew what we needed to do and I wanted to develop some things over a period of time um, from athlete contribution to athlete participation to the athletes driving the program, it changed. Now, of course, when you're coaching uh, small children, they're not in a position where they can drive the program, they need direction and whatever. But the point I'm making is that over a period of time, my coaching style and approach to the team that I was coaching changed quite dramatically. And if you look, I then had a period when I was coaching the men's team, same thing. Um, before I took over, which was Beijing, right up until after London and the last game that you saw right at the beginning, um, my uh, coaching style changed and the approach to the, to the program changed. And uh, I think it goes to the message that I, I uh, said earlier, coaching is a dynamic thing, you have to be flexible, there has to be change uh, over time. Please. <coughs> Some of these slides, I don't have the time to explain it uh, in the detail that's necessary, but I'm going to be here for two, two days, and I welcome you to come and talk to me at any time during that time. I know that uh, there's a range of coaches here. If there's something that you want to uh, question, then please feel free to do so. Number three <coughs> is that you, uh, you have to challenge people. You have to... Uh, uh, ask questions. You have to expect that they can do more and better. I coached in our national program for 14 years, but I, as I said, from the time I was 17 years old, I have been involved in coaching. And I never met an athlete yet. I never met an athlete yet who knew how good they could be. Who knew how good they could be. And my job as the coach was to keep lifting the bar, extending them, expecting them to do more. And with young children, it's the same thing. They're on, a, they're on a, a course of discovery. They don't know what's possible. Your role as the coach is to stretch the boundaries a little bit every day, progressively. So over a period of time, they discover what's possible and what they can do. Things that may not have seemed possible. <coughs> Here you have a, a gold medalist at the Olympics. Uh, from this little country and uh, many many people wouldn't have believed this was possible is that is that fair it, it seemed impossible well there's a little country just to the east of Australia called New Zealand which has a population of uh, not much more than Singapore which does remarkably well in international sport and uh, it isn't about uh, the numbers it's about the quality of your program the commitment of the individuals the people who want to uh, set for themselves high goals which leads me on to ambition if you want to be good then you really have to uh, uh, have ambitious aims and goals when I was a when I was a young athlete I remember reading a book on sports psychology <coughs> a thing called psycho cybernetics and I bet you there's only one or two people in this audience who have read that book. Put your hands up. Yeah, I knew it would be you, Vern. Well, there are some more. Psycho-Cybernetics was the only book about, which had anything about sports psychology in the 70s. Nobody paid much attention to it back then. It just goes to show how old Vern and I are. <coughs> you've, got much, you've got much more hair than me, though, Vern. <coughs> but... <coughs> Psycho-Cybernetics was written by a guy called Maxwell Maltz. And Maxwell Maltz wasn't a psychologist, he was in fact a plastic surgeon. And what he found was after he had operated on his uh, 
patients that their whole approach to life changed. And the central thesis of the book was that we are like guided missiles in our lives. We usually end up where we aim. And so if you want to aim high, then you, if you want to achieve high, you've got to aim high. You have to have high ambition. If you want to win a gold medal at the Olympics, then you go to the Olympics not thinking, isn't it great to be an Olympian? You go to the Olympics thinking, I want to be in the main race at the end of the tournament. I want to be in the main game at the end of the tournament. And you have to have that sort of ambition. If you want your local little team to win the local league, then <coughs> they, they need to have that sort of ambition. And it's important that, uh, that you do that. I was uh, part of the most unsuccessful ever Australian Olympic team. The most unsuccessful ever Australian Olympic team was in 1976. And if you look at this slide on the left, you can see this is what the media was saying three months before the Olympics. 30 medals. That's the tip for Montreal. That's the story in the media three, three months before the Olympics in 1976 in Montreal. And Australia for the first time or for the one of the few times in the modern history of the Olympics came home without a gold medal. The hockey team that I was part of uh, won the silver medal. That was the best anybody in Australia did. It was the catalyst for the establishment of the Australian Institute of Sport four years later. That terrible performance at the Olympics. It was, it was a good outcome, if you like, in, in the end. And uh, the Australian uh, Institute of Sport was established, I think, uh, uh, um, Conceptually, it was a wonderful idea. They got the practicality of it wrong because they built a big institute in one place. And of course, Australia, that, that would work in uh, Singapore. I'm sure you have those things. But in Australia, we're a very big country. And uh, most people in Australia don't live in Canberra where they built it. Indeed, um, they did four things. They said, we're going to build facilities for, for uh, competition. We're going to, for the first time, uh, provide support for athletes, we're going to provide support for coaches <coughs> and uh, we're going to build an infrastructure in sport and develop coaches in Australia and maybe bring some from overseas for experience. And indeed uh, from 1976 until 1996 Australia was uh, slowly building its way back up into the sporting hierarchy. It wasn't. Australia had traditionally been in the top 10 medal winners at the Olympics. It wasn't until 1996, 20 years after the Australian Institute of Sport was established, that we were back up there again. So it was a long-term thing. It was ambitious, but indeed uh, there were lessons to learn from, uh, from it. Now, I was coach of the national women's team. So that, that was number four. Here's number five, <coughs> and it's about uh, leadership. And my view is that leadership is for everybody, certainly for the coaches. And if you, as your team becomes more sophisticated, as your squad becomes more sophisticated, then it's for everybody in the team and the squad. And uh, when I was uh, coaching the national women's team before the Sydney Olympics, over a period of time we developed a leadership group. By the time we got to the Olympics in a team sport, this is very controversial, we didn't have a captain. Because I wanted everybody in the team to behave and act like a captain and to show leadership. And uh, we wanted to avoid the thing that is number two on the list there, which is social loafing. Social loafing is what occurs when you get a group of people together and you give them a task and you tell them to do it and you appoint some, one person as the leader. What happens to the other people in the group? They become more passive, they're less involved, less interested, they wait for somebody else to tell them what to do. In sport, you have to have and play with initiative. Your team has to be able to make decisions and judgments. All of the important judgments and decisions made in a team sport like, like ours are made by players on the field, not by coaches on the sideline. Coaches might help set the tone and the pattern. We spend our time at training, equipping our athletes to make good decisions and judgments. And so leadership's for everybody. And uh, I think that's a very important message. Coaching is getting much more sophisticated. And so 
What's the main difference between coaching now and when I started playing in the 70s? Now, I'm not going to answer this question. I've been answering lots of them. I want you to tell me. What's the main difference that occurs in coaching now in the 2018 year compared with in the 70s? What's one of the most powerful weapons that you have when you're coaching your athletes? Analytics. And what allows the analytics? What didn't we have before? When I, when I first played in the 70s, we used to coach, the coaches used to coach us by anecdote. Do you understand what an anecdote is? It's a story about what happened. They'd say, oh, this happened. <clears throat> what do we do now instead of say, this happened in the 10th minute of the game or when that goal was scored, this is where you were. What do we do now? We want to know what happened in the, when the goal was scored. What do we do? We do the video. We look at the video. We have a lie detector test. We know what happened. It's there in front of you. You can confront the athletes with it. You use video all the time. For you people, you young coaches, it's so second nature. You don't know. Before video, there was coaching by anecdote. This is what happened. And everybody's recollection of what happened was different. The guy who made the mistake couldn't quite remember and the guys who were next to him who thought he'd made the mistake were telling him. <coughs> but the reality is now we can see, look, this is what happened. And so we have this, this resource that was never available and then out of that has come digital analysis. Even before the Sydney Olympics, we, we didn't have digital analysis. We were on analogue. You're going back and forward, the tape it was driving you nuts. <coughs> And in our game, for instance, and this is just an example because every game's different, in Stefan's caper, then it's all about the time, you know, but it's small bits of time that are critical. But in our game, there's only one or two goals scored in the match sometimes, although we got six in that game you saw earlier. That was very nice. <coughs> um, this is the half-time stats. They're off the TV, so they're not very sophisticated. So we're playing... In 2010, the World Cup final against Germany, the score's 1-0 at half-time, as you can see on the left there. The interesting stat is, though, penetration to the circle are 13 to 4. They're the numbers behind the numbers. You have to make those numbers to get the number. You, you, you have to make four or five or six penetrations before you get a goal, a decent goal shot sometimes. And before you score a goal, you might have to make 10 or 13. <coughs> The numbers on the right there are four years later, the World Cup final again. This time we're playing the Netherlands. Scores 2-1 at half time. So in a low scoring game, the score's close, but the penetrations are 17-3. to That's a dominant performance, even though the score's close. <coughs> now, <coughs> those numbers tell you a story. Once, I remember when I was coaching the women's team, we played a tournament in Atlanta before the Olympics, and we lost to Spain. 2-1 that day, we had 28 shots at goal and they had two. And that's what can happen in a game like hockey, which is low scoring. And after the game, when you're analysing the game, do you look at the score and say, oh God, we were terrible today, we lost? Or do you say, hang on, we had 28 shots at goal. Um, you know, our shooting was poor, we've got to work on that. This has got to be better. Their goalkeeper had a terrific game, credit to her. Um, we made a couple of fatal errors and it cost us. But essentially, what we were doing was, was pretty good. We played them a week later in the final of that tournament, so we stayed in it and got to the final and beat them 4-0. And we had less shots at goal and more against that day. The point being that you've got to look at the numbers. The numbers tell you something they're important and increasingly in sport we, we do that. And those little, those little moments are important for us measuring what happens. No one scores a goal against our team when I'm, as a hockey coach. No one scores a goal against our team unless we get four or five things consecutively wrong. This person missed a tackle, that one was out of position, this one didn't chase hard enough, this happened, that goal shot. And any of those single incidents is different and we've got the ball and it's going in the other direction. So, you know, those little pieces are important and what video allows us to do and what analysis allows us to do is to look at those things very closely. In Australia, one of our finest ever athletes was uh, Herb Elliott. 
here he is, he's winning the uh, 1500 metres in the Olympic Games in, in Rome in 1960. The time that Herb Elliott ran that day in 1960 would have won the gold medal at the next six Olympics. And if you go seven Olympics, it would have won a silver. Extraordinary performance. He, he retired very young. But this is a quote from Elliot. The champion understands that small compromises, small compromises that are evident only to them, are not small compromises at all. They are a decision to concede on championship and slip back to the rest of the field. And you make a mistake when you compromise. And <coughs> this is a high-end thing, I admit. But it seeps into your program if you allow these things <coughs> to take root. This is my worst day as a coach in 14 years. <coughs> What's the score? See it there on the top left? 1-0. It's the semi-final in the London Olympics, so it's not so long ago. Um, and we're leading 1-0. And we had to defend a penalty corner. You have a minute to sort out how you're going to defend a penalty corner, and we played Germany two years earlier in the World Cup final, they were a very fine team. And I was worried two years earlier because I thought we didn't have a, a good defence for the penalty corners and I was always concerned about our goalkeeping because goalkeeping can bring you down in a slow, low scoring game. But I thought we had, we'd worked it out and we, we had the right antidote for the German corner. I'm not going to show you this clip, I don't think it's on here, but <clears throat> maybe it, when I speak to the hockey people tomorrow, I'll show it to you in detail so you can see the pain that I experienced. But our goalkeeper made the wrong call. I was sitting on the bench and I was like, what the hell are we doing here? What's going on? And, and we had centrally two defences that had to occur that day and, and it depended on who the Germans had at the top of the circle. So it was, it was, you only had to look at the top of the circle, oh, he's here, we do this. Or, oh, he's not there, we, we do this. And he got it wrong. And they had a minute to prepare for the defence of the corner and uh, Germany scored. It was one all at half time. <clears throat> and it was a situation we should have defended. We are still leading 10 minutes to go in the game and we made another clanger and then another. And then with the two minutes to go, we're, we're trailing. It was, uh, it was a horrible experience sitting watching it. But I believe, and I look back on it and we talked about it afterwards, that... Uh, what happened that day was twofold. It was unfortunately the culture of our team wasn't as strong as I thought it was because not only did the goalkeeper made a mistake, but there were four other people defending here, and one of them had played 300 games. He was very experienced. And when I asked them afterwards what happened, why didn't you say something? They said, "Oh, we didn't want to upset him. We knew he had to play the defence. We thought it was the wrong call, but we, I wish they'd had a fight." on the field. You know, the umpire was rushing them and trying to hurry them along, but <coughs> point, point being, that was poor. But six months earlier, I was unhappy with our goalkeeping program and I wanted to change the goalkeeping coach in our program. It was quite controversial. It was just before Christmas. We just played a tournament and we just returned from overseas and everybody was tired. I said, look, our goalkeeping program is not good enough. Got, there's not enough rigour in it. And I was stopped from doing it by the organisation. They didn't want me to do it. And I went that close to resigning. And then I thought, oh, that's very churlish. We can still win even if the goalkeeping's not perfect, you know. And six months later, eight months later, I was regretting that because I think, I, I, I thought we had a difficulty there. I wanted to make a change and I compromised. And I had authority in the sport. I was, uh, you know, I was a senior coach. I had runs on the board. I could have pushed harder and harder but I was tired it was the end of the year, Christmas was coming and I didn't I didn't make the change that we probably should have changed. Maybe if we'd done that we would have had a different goalkeeper. We picked the guy with the best reflexes but not the best decision maker and we weren't rigorous enough in how we went about doing that I think. So I regret that to my day, never compromise. Now you have to get the culture right and I'm going to show you a little clip now, and none of you would have seen this. What's the score in the game? 0-0. Zero, zero. We're in the fourth quarter, and how long to play? 
three, three and a half minutes, okay? So this is a tight situation. Three minutes to play. This is the final of the World League. It's played in Antwerp in 2016. It's between Belgium and Australia, the number one and number four team in the world. They're very good teams. They've got to the final of the World League. Qualification for the World Cup is at stake. You know, they can automatically get through and they avoid all of the other bits. So it's an important match. Australia versus Belgium, three minutes to go, nil-nil, lots of tension. And uh, it's the week of Wimbledon. And in Australia, we've got a tennis player, Nick Kurios. Who's heard of Nick Kurios? Yeah. Nick Kurios is a bit of a nutter. And he'd done crazy things that week. Indeed, the stories in the Australian newspaper for the whole week were what terrible sportsmen Australians were, what poor, poor sportsmanship. Nick Kurios turned his back on the other guy, abused the umpire, got in a fight with the crowd, played through his, all the stuff that he does, you know? And it, oh, what terrible sportsmanship. I mean, in Australia, we're very sensitive about this at the moment. Yesterday, the report in our cricket team came out and it wasn't good. And, you know, you would think that the media would be interested in a story like this one, but no one, none of you, I'm sure, would have seen this clip. This was on Foxtel during the, during the Wimbledon tournament. And it was the hockey team playing in the final of the World League in uh, Antwerp. <coughs> We got no volume. Hello, we got some volume? <coughs> the touch to play in Orchard. Kavanagh. Swan man. Demon stepped up into that right pocket. Swan spotted the gap, goes on the top of and there's the cross in. Orchard's gonna have a chance here outside the post. Oh, good goal, and they score! Kieran goes short, but automatically. The Belgian team have run away to Ragu Prasad to ask for the video referral. I'll go for it. You have foot? You have foot? Oh, thanks, Kieran. Well, Kieran Goers has just admitted that he kicked it. What an unbelievable bit of sportsmanship. He stuck his hand and said, you know what? I kicked this. Before it goes into the into the thing, it's come off a body. He's already said, before it goes in, that there's a foot. That's exceptional sportsmanship at this level of competition. So why do you do that? Want to win fair and square? The Swiss would never cheat. <laughs> it's the right thing to do, isn't it? It's the right thing to do, but there's always a few cynical people in the audience say, oh, it would have been discovered by the video referral anyway, because we, more than soccer, we've had that for years, you know. Um, but the video referral is not always right. Sometimes it makes mistakes. But we used to talk about this situation in our team all the time, because we were trying to develop a culture which was truly excellent. And as a coach, I, I wanted them to do this. Not all the team agreed with it. Not everybody in the team thought it was the right thing to do. Some of them said, oh, well, sometimes we get a really bad decision, it's unfair, so when it comes our way, we should take it. And there's pressure. There's only, as I said, three minutes to go, it's a critical match. <clears throat> but one of the rules that we had in our team, one of the things that we discussed and we debated this often was we never, never, never cheat. We never, never, never cheat. And as a coach, I wanted that because that meant there was no shortcuts in our training. There was no easy way, that path that we were going to find. You had to get what you earned. And indeed, when I coached the women's team for nearly a decade, there were a number of instances where our players did the same thing. This is just, if you like, the most recent example. And indeed, in London at the Olympics, one of our players did it. And the umpire insisted on going to the video referral, and our guide said, no, it's, it's not a goal. <laughs> crazy. The point being, um, you develop a culture where you're really seeking to be excellent. There are no shortcuts. This is no easy way. We're going to we're only get, get what we earn. It's a it's an important lesson for life. It's an important lesson for your team. It's a it's a way you you probably should seek to live your life. And I think that uh, sports a vehicle for those sorts of lessons in a very very 
good and interesting way. I talked about our cricket team. Um, in the year that we won the World Cup in uh, New Delhi, um, I took these two photographs. The photograph uh, on the left is in front of India Gate in the centre of Delhi. The hockey stadium where we played the World Cup final in Delhi was just maybe a kilometre away from there. And that was taken on the morning of the World Cup final, the photo on the left, uh, 14 hours later, uh, after having won the tournament, the other photo was taken. And um, we, we, our cricket team was very controversial in Australia. And in the same year, they, had, they were playing a series against England. And the most important game of the series against England was the Boxing Day Test Match in, in Melbourne. It's an it's a institution in WA. 100,000 people go to the MCG to watch the Boxing Day Test. And the series was one all against England, so it was a pivotal match. And the start of the cricket, cricket starts at 11 o'clock in the morning. And what did the Australian cricketers do on the morning of the Boxing Day Test, the most important test of the year for them with the series one all in preparation for their game against England. They lost the game badly, I might say. They lost the series, they lost the next couple of matches. And, but on the morning of the Boxing Day test, they went to Shane Warne's breakfast function to listen to some comedians telling stories and jokes for an hour and a half while they ate their bacon and eggs. <clears throat> and. Uh, they played badly that day and didn't do well. What did we do on the morning of the World Cup that we played in the same year in New Delhi? We took that photograph in front of India Gate on the way home from training. We went training on the morning of the World Cup. Just a light run, nothing difficult, just to pass some time to, to help the players prepare to get them out of the hotel and give them something to do. And uh, I tell that story and, and people, that, that's about your culture. That's the, that's the way you go about doing what you're doing. And I think it's, uh, it's an important little uh, message. Famous photograph from football. Everybody knows the story about Zinedine Zidane, one of the greatest footballers ever. And he's turned out to be a very, very successful coach with Real Madrid. But in 2006, Real Madrid finished 27 points off the top of the league in Spain. That's a really bad result. And this is a quote from Zinedine Zidane. The problem this season was there were too many strong personalities in the dressing room. We didn't communicate properly because we were too afraid of upsetting one another. What's he saying? <clears throat> the problem this season was there were too many strong personalities in the dressing room. These guys are paid millions and millions of euros a month. They're the richest sportsmen, some of them the richest sportsmen in their sport on the planet. They're very good. <clears throat> and in uh, a sport like football, if you've got the most money, you get the best players, you ought to be winning. And Real Madrid usually do. They do very well. They had a horrendous season. And Zinedine Zidane, one of their great players in the team, this is his uh, uh, description of what happened. What should have been happening in the dressing room there? When the team was going badly, what are those players responsible for? Is it the coach's job or is it theirs? Because if your team's going really badly, I would have thought they would have been getting with the coach and saying, look, this isn't happening, we've got to change this, how are we going to do this better? <coughs> it's not working, what's the formula? They're responsible for getting better. I think there were no strong personalities in the dressing room. Because if there were strong personalities in the dressing room, they would have been challenging one another to improve and do better and to change things and to work harder. They all sat there, took their money, got flogged every week and uh, seemed to be satisfied. And the point that I would make is that it is important if you're going to have an effective team, whether it's a coaching team, it's a team of athletes, it's the administrators, whatever, People have to say what they think. They have to be able to do that. You have to be able to challenge one another. 
And if you're unwilling to do so, then you're ineffective. Now, a guy called Jack Welsh, who was the CEO of General Electric, <clears throat> very one of the biggest countries, companies in the world, wrote a book called Winning. It's sort of a sporting name, but it's a business book. And Jack Welsh devoted a whole chapter of the book to candor, although he spelt it wrong, because uh, Americans don't know spelling. <coughs> uh, but he said, the biggest dirty secret in business is lack of candor. It stops good people being promoted. It slows down your organisation. It clogs it up. It delays decision making. And in your team and in your coaching group, you have to be able to say what you think. That's not a good. We could do that better. How are we going to improve that? What's what's going to make a difference here? This isn't working. And unless you have that, then your team isn't efficient. It's not working as well as it can. It doesn't uh, get to where it, you, it ought. And to get candor, you've got to be willing, and coaches have to be involved in what I call critical conversations, crucial conversations. This is a quote from a book on crucial conversations. Think about your own experience. Can you remember receiving really blistering feedback from someone at some point in your life, but in that instance you didn't become defensive? Because normally when we get we hear messages we don't want to hear, we do what we're taught to do by our amygdala, fight or flight. You run away <clears throat> or you get defensive. Instead, you absorbed the feedback, you reflected on it, you allowed it to influence you. If you ask yourself why, it was because you believed the other person had your best interests in mind and you respected their opinions. And if you are a coach, you have to become that person. You have to become the person who the athlete believes has their best interests in mind and who is respected for their opinions, their knowledge, their, their capacity. It's a crucial thing. You have to be involved in telling people things could be better, you've got to make it. we've got to make changes, we have to lift the bar, and so you have to go into this area where you have to have crucial conversations. And you have to become the person who's respected for their knowledge and who those people believe has their best interests at heart. That's the art and craft of being a capable coach. Now in Western Australia I used to get invited to to speak at mining conferences. We're very big <coughs> digging things out of the ground and selling them to the Chinese. And it's, uh, it's good business. The mining industry's not going so well anymore, so there's not so many conferences to speak at. But I remember going to one maybe a decade ago now, and the guy who was speaking before me was a production manager at a mine. And he got up <coughs> onto the stage and uh, he started by saying, I've been the production manager at this mine for four years now, and I spend 95% of my time on safety. And everybody, all you know, the mining executives and people, all their eyes rolled, oh God, here we go, the safety talk, you know? And he went on for about 10 minutes talking about all the things that he'd done to improve safety at the mine and how how uh, he was very proud of what was happening. And they were all sort of starting to nod off, hopefully not like you people are now. <laughs> and um, he said, but you're all interested in production, aren't you? Because he'd put up a graph showing how effective he had been in decreasing the number of incidents that occurred over the four years. Number of incidents, time, and there was a dramatic fall. He said, you all want to know about production, don't you? And then their ears pricked up a little bit and he said, and here's the production results at my mind for the last four years. And he drew a graph going the other way, exponential in improvement. And he said, the reason that this is the most productive mine in the country, the re he'd been asked to speak because he, he'd been successful. The reason this is the most productive mine in the country is because everybody who works at this mine knows that I care about them. The most important thing is that they go home safely after work every day. And their families know it. And everybody involved with our mind knows it. And so if we have a problem, they want this mind to succeed, we all work together to fix it. <clears throat> he exemplified, if you like, the message that's there. The stuff that's important um, if you want to be an effective coaching communicator. 
Opportunity builds belief. Everyone needs it. And the little quote underneath, ignore youth at your peril. You know, what young people bring to your program is fresh ideas, a new experience, an open mind, a willingness to learn. And uh, when you're in a position of a coach, then you're in a position where you can influence them in a really positive way. It's an important thing. But I tell this story sometimes because I think it's an important one. In 1994, when I was a new coach with the national women's team, I used to go to the national championships. I didn't know the players as well as I would over time. But I went to the national championships that year and I was looking for talented players scouting like, uh, like your cycling guy for, for talent. And uh, I saw a young girl from Victoria who was playing for her state and I thought, hmm, she looks a bit interesting. She's not in our squad. She has no one's mentioned her to me because the selectors used to say, oh, you look at these ones. And I asked the other selectors, I said, what do you think about that girl? And they said to me, oh, she's not good enough. She used to be in the team before you with a coach. She was at the AIS program in Perth for two years. We've trained her, we've had her in the team, but she's not good enough. And I, you know, I, I didn't necessarily agree. I and mean, I watched for another day or two and I, I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And I went and talked to the girl. She was sitting watching another game and I went and sat beside her and I, I asked her to tell me her story. She said, oh yeah, I went to Perth for the AIS for two years. I've been, I was in the, the team for a little while. I've been overseas with the national team five times. So she'd five times been in the team. I've played 11 minutes. So she was one of the people that was sitting on the bench. And then at the last minute of the game, they put her on and oh, you didn't do anything, you know, or whatever. She, she played 11 minutes. And I don't know how you can tell if anybody's good if you only see them for that amount of time. And I watched again and I said to the sleeper, I want to include her in our squad. We need to bring her to Perth again and, and see what she can do. And uh, she came uh, across to our program and was in our program for the next couple of years. She got a, uh, a knee injury and so she didn't play any longer than that. Her last game for Australia was the Olympic final. She's a gold medalist now, that girl. Because she was good enough, she, she injured her knee afterwards and so her career ended. But this was someone who they told me wasn't good enough. If you sit people on the bench and you don't give them opportunity, you're effectively saying, we don't believe in you, you're not good enough. And the most important, one of the most important things that a coach has in their arsenal is to, to say to the athlete, I believe in you, I think you can do this. And so that's what <clears throat> is important. You have to provide people with opportunity. The very best thing I did as a coach when I took over the national team was I said, anybody who gets selected in our squad is going to play. And we're going to play them in real matches against real opposition and we'll find out. And I was lucky, you know, and luck's pretty important. I was lucky because the rules had changed in our sport that allowed interchange. So instead of 11 players on the bench and just a couple who could play on substitutes, we were allowed to go on and off. And so we started to do that. And uh, it, uh, after two years of, the, of that, instead of, we played... 16 minutes every time. I'm getting a wind up. <coughs> Is that right? <coughs> I thought I had. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, after uh, after um, after a while, we had 50 players who played a number of matches. You know, <coughs> and and so we built depth in our program by doing that. Teamwork's critical. I talk about conscious interlocking individuality. That means people are allowed to be brilliant individuals, but they also have to understand their place in the team. <clears throat> doubt's a good thing. Everybody thinks doubt's a bad thing. This is a lovely quote. Doubt is the foundation of all knowledge and the motor of all change. And indeed, you, you, every coach, everybody has doubts. Doubts are the things that fuel our curiosity. Training creates good habits. You better be understanding that. It's the stuff I said of Aristotle. We are what we continually do. Excellence is not an act, it's a habit. And it's important for us 
to do that. Ericsson said, 10,000 hours to be an expert. I like the quote at the top. It says, if you do the same thing over and over again, it's pretty boring, isn't it? Well, no, you have to keep changing what you do. You have to try and do things that are more difficult and harder. And indeed, you don't develop mastery of something until <coughs> you put in the hours and the time. Those of us in coaching understand that very well. I'll miss that one, but uh, this is important. For me, the most competitive advantage in sport is in human behaviour. And every coach thinks they're a psychologist, and we are. We understand psychology, we know how it works. But what I think is really critically important is that I'm not an expert in psychology and in human behaviour, and that's where the competitive edge is in sport. Sports science and all the clever stuff you've got to do. If you don't do that well, you're not going to be in the contest, but you better understand human behaviour. And we're not sports psychologists. We need people to help us. You need uh, skill there. This quote from <coughs> Tolstoy is important. <coughs> the suggestion is that, it, that the battle's on tomorrow. This is life and death. Andre's talking to the soldiers about what's going to happen the next day. What does it depend on? He says, you know, the theory is that, well, the battle's just chess pieces moving. The difference is that each soldier has different skills and abilities. Each of your athletes has different skills and abilities. And indeed, you need to find how they can help you, what makes a difference. In the end, it's what's inside them that is often the critical difference. And the last, the last thing, uh, humility. Um, humility underpins a, a disciplined approach to your lifestyle and uh, a way in which you can uh, understand how you have to get better. The best athletes are athletes that are humble. They understand uh, that uh, they're fortunate to be in the position and they, uh, they know that really being an athlete is about how you can gain more quality and be better. I thank you for the opportunity and uh, I look forward to the panel discussion that's going to follow. Thank you.